we've been making our way through this great letter. I'm excited to preach through it. Uh, it's my first attempt in uh, close to 30 years of ministry to ever preach through 1 Corinthians. And uh, I'm enjoying it. I hope you are. It is God's Word. It was written to a New Covenant church. It was written to a, a, in a time in which we have many similar struggles. Many similar struggles. The culture in Corinth is, was much like ours. All kinds of competing religious ideas, cultural ideas, ethical ideas, moral ideas. You had all kinds of arrogance floating around in society. People thinking uh, all kinds of crazy. If, if you get into the crazy culture of Corinth, how many think like every week I see on the news? I mean, I, I mean let me rephrase that. Daily. <laughs> daily. How many read something daily that really shocks you? And some of you are like... I, I have no clue what you're talking about. It's because you don't look at the news at all, okay? I mean, every day, some of you sometimes will send me articles, have you seen this? Well, it was much like Corinth. And the problem is, what if you started telling me, hey, Pastor Kendall, I mean, you must not be reaching the culture. Because look at culture. Look at how culture is going to hell in a handbasket, and how come we're not stopping the sliding of culture further down the drain? I'd be like, um, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how to stop it either. And what if you were to start to judge me uh, by looking at culture saying, we're not stopping it like we should, and you would want me to start changing the message that you're hearing, and you would want me to change, we, we are to change the message that we're to preach to the culture. You know, Pastor, Jesus and him crucified for sins? Come on, really? Can we change the message? Can we tell them that if they come to church and, and start following God, they're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise? How about if we start teaching a prosperity message that if you follow God, you're not going to have any problems He's going to come to your rescue all the time. You're never going to be sick. You're never going to be in the hospital. You're going to have all your bills paid. You're going to be wealthy. And if you're not, something's wrong with you. Does that message sound good? Well, that's what happens sometimes. And it would be very tempting. Imagine if you came here for over a year and you never heard me mention the word sin. Wouldn't you say something's wrong? What if you sat in a church and, and for 10 years you never heard the word sin? Would something really be wrong? Well, that happens in America, and it was a temptation in the first century. Let me remind ourselves a little bit of background about Corinth. Corinth was a major city in Paul's day and age. This, this city uh, was... Not only extravagant, as you can see, this is, I mean, if you go to the ruins of Corinth today, you're going to have the modern city of Corinth, and then you're going to have the ruins of Corinth, in which they make great illustrations like this. And you can go down through each one of these, and you can see what the stadium was, and how many the stadium uh, held. And over here, you have a, a temple to this false deity, and emperor worship, and all kinds of crazy ideas, much like our own. And so now Paul is trying to defend, and I think this is good for all of us to think through, to make sure you and I, first of all, make sure me, as a pastor, we don't have apostles anymore, but as a teacher, preacher, so you step down from apostles, and pastors are supposed to be teaching God's word. So I see the temptation. Temptation would be to give into culture. Start giving people and culture what they want to hear instead of preaching the cross and him crucified and saying, look, you, you, you have a problem. You have a sin problem like all of us. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, I want to pray for your marriage and I want to pray for your health and I want to pray for your kids and I want to pray for your job situation. But Sally, Jesus Christ is your ultimate answer. Because if we give them anything less, is God going to fix all of those things? Not necessarily. 
everyone's need, first of all, is to come to grips that they're a sinner who's going to stand in judgment one day. That's the number one question. And how can I be reconciled? How can I be forgiven? How can I have eternal life? The message is clear. It's only by believing in Jesus Christ and him alone. His death and resurrection brings forgiveness of sins where he comes in then to dwell within you, to give you a new perspective on life, a whole new way of living. And does it sometimes, because you're living the way the Lord wants you to live, can things get better? Heck yeah, no doubt. Did my life radically change when I became a Christian? Did it put me on a new path? So becoming a Christian can change the direction of your life. But it doesn't always, sometimes your life gets worse. Sometimes you lose all of your friends. Sometimes your spouse wants to divorce you. I have a friend that was an executive in a company that his wife literally abused him physically and would beat on him because she wanted to be a rock star. She wanted to be a country singer, not a rock star, a country singer. So she, she divorced him and moved to Nashville. I could give you all kinds of stories. Sometimes when you become a Christian, your life doesn't get better. But it's worth living. It's worth living. Knowing the God of the universe, knowing that I have forgiveness, nothing can replace that. So as we go through 1 Corinthians again, you've got to keep some of that in mind. I can't go back every Sunday and rehash it. But let's now jump to chapter 4. Because Paul's been evaluated about his message needing to change. No doubt Apollos was probably a better preacher than Paul. And so they're evaluating Paul and Apollos. But there are so many wonderful truths, not just for me as a pastor, but for all of us. Now when we get to chapter 5 on, we're going to start dealing with some of the problems within the church at Corinth itself. Right now, Paul seems to be still uh, defending his ministry that's coming under attack. And so even though it is applied to apostles, I'm going to apply it once again to pastors, and I'm going to apply it to you. There's some great principles on here uh, in this text, 1 through 7, to take to heart. Take a look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not acquitted. I'm not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Verse 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then to each man's praise will come to him from God. So these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Verse 7. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray and then we'll jump in. Lord, once again, as we open your word, speak through it. Not only do we worship you through prayer and through singing, we now worship you through the reading, the hearing, and the obeying of your word. Holy Spirit, we ask that you bring conviction where needed and encouragement where needed. And as always, if there's any among us who do not know you savingly, they've never been born again, they don't have your spirit dwelling within them, God, we pray that you would draw them to yourself. What a joy it is to know you. Paul says, let a man, let people regard us, Paul and Apollos and Peter, 
in this manner. And since we don't have apostles today, I would say it would be good to understand ministers in this category. Then I would say it's good for you to understand yourself in this category. And even though there are some disjunctions, there are some powerful um, things that we can all apply to our lives. Paul, and I would say pastors, who, do, who are they ultimately accountable to? Now, let me just, as I look around here, how many of you have a boss over you? Maybe the, the owner of a company, or maybe you're the owner of the company. But if you work for somebody, a corporation, or somebody owns it, maybe a corporation owns it, you work for them, right? And they tell you what to do, and here's your job qualifications, and this is how you carry out your job. And if somebody else from another company would come over and say, hey, you're not doing this quite right, um, you would be like, well, this is what my boss has told me to do. I am ultimately accountable to my boss, right, those over me. Now, if you own your own company, great. But think about that. Those who are under you, if you own your own company, these people are accountable ultimately to you. So if you're, as me as a pastor, this is mo both encouraging and frightening at the same time, right? To understand that not only apostles, but pastors were different than a lot of your jobs. Friends of mine, uh, well, I, before I became a pastor, I built transformers, three-phase and single-phase transformers. There's a different evaluation. If you think about your own job, you're evaluated differently. Some of you make spark plugs. I'm not going to ask how many of you. There are quite a few of you, right? And I'm sure, when, depending on what your job is, there are certain things that you could judge how well you're doing at your job. If you're a mechanic and you, you own your own automobile uh, repair shop, Jeff has people that work under him. I'm sure there's a way for Jeff to tell how well those under his care are actually doing, right? If every, if every car, and this isn't true of Jeff, <laughs> but imagine, man, it just keeps, Jeff, I drove it a mile and it broke down again. All of our jobs have different ways that we could evaluate them. Well, what about with Paul being an apostle and a church planner? How is he to be evaluated? He was being evaluated because he's not reaching the culture like the Corinthians thought he should. And they, the temptation so far in, in the letter of 1 Corinthians is, change the message. And what did Paul say? You know, when I came here, I preached Christ and him crucified. The message to the lost, the message to the world is to come and have a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the message to the world. The message to the world is not, I've got a great way for you to get your finances in order. The message to the world is, I've got a great way for you to have a happy marriage. It's not that. It is to the world, it's, you're going to die one day. And I've got bad news for you. The Bible says we're all sinners in need of forgiveness. How are you doing in that area? What are you trusting in to commend yourself before Almighty God? The only way, and this is narrow, Jesus, how many of you believe Jesus when he said he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can get to the Father except through him, John 14, 6. If you believe that and you share it with people, there will be people who think you are narrow-minded, backwards, and an idiot. They will. A friend of mine who was a missionary in Belgium, spent many years on the mission field, he said, Kendall, the number one thing that people wanted to know over in Europe was, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? Do you believe he is the only way for eternal life? And they may not have phrased it just like that, but he said, if you stood your ground and said, yes, a, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ is the only way to know the true and living God. That's the main question they wanted to know. And he said, when I came back to the States, and this has been like 20 years now, he said, you know, you guys are coming with, your, this, nothing's new. People want to know, what you believe about God. Are you so narrow-minded to believe that Jesus and Him alone is the only way to have true forgiveness and the gift of eternal life? And, and by the way, there are tons of scriptures on this. And when we stand that ground, the temptation is going to be, let's change the message. 
let's change it. Because it sure doesn't seem to be working. Ah, pragmatism coming in. How many of your jobs, on your jobs, it's proper to have pragmatic approach to things? Crunch the numbers. How's the report? Run the, run the report. How are we doing? How many sales have we had? Right? But when it comes to spiritual issues, it's totally different. Whose job is it ultimately to save people? It's our job to preach the gospel far and wide. That's why we send out missionaries. That's why we are to witness ourselves. But it's God's job. We're just messengers. Remember we saw that last week? We're mere servants through whom you believed, we saw in chapter 3. And so now he says that we're servants of Christ and we're stewards. This is an interesting word. We're managers of the mysteries of God. So my, my job every Sunday is not to preach Christ crucified. Did you know that? That's our message to the world. Now we talk about the cross and we talk about the resurrection, but every Sunday when you come in, you're not getting Christ crucified. But because we're told to teach the what? The whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. That's why I love going through books, because that way God sets the agenda. So we went through Hebrews, all the way through Hebrews. God was setting the agenda. Romans. Romans is great, but there's some tough chapters, right? Same way with 1 Corinthians. There's some great stuff in Corinthians, and there's some stuff you're going to shake your head at and say, what does that mean? How many of you have read the Old Testament recently? If you read the Old Testament, are there going to be some sections that you need to write down a question and turn in that box? Right? Yeah. Well, one of my jobs as a pastor is to teach God's Word. Not that I have all the answers, but I'm going to study and I'm going to pray and I'm going to seek to give you an answer because that's one of my duties to help people of God. And so it is a great blessing, but also a, a frightful thought every single Sunday that I stand here. And by the way, it should also scare you. Is the message that you're giving people correct? Do you know you're the best Christian somebody knows? That you're actually a counselor? Because if people ask you questions, if they know you're a Christian and they ask you a question, my, my, my question would be, is what you're giving them actually biblical? Imagine if somebody asked one of you, how can you get to heaven? You say, well, there are a lot of different ways. If you're a pretty good person, I think that will be fine. Wrong! <laughs> right? How many understand that? Our culture out there believes that lie. There are many times where I hear people give advice biblically, and I'm like, that is not what the Bible says at all. God helps those who help themselves. How many of you heard that? It's not a Bible verse, even though you might think that that's good advice. God helps those who help themselves. It's not in the Bible. Imagine if we say that to people. Is that really true? In some ways, yes, and in other ways, absolutely not. Well, Grandma, your grandma died. She's now an angel in heaven. Is that true? That's not true. And so all of us, when we think about it, if we're giving out God's word, that's a weighty thing. And I hope you feel the weight, not only for me, but if we're to give out, how many would say, you, you, do you know all of us here as Christians are in a way servants of Christ? Even though my duty might be as a, my vocation might be as a pastor, my spiritual gift as pastoring, if you're a Christian, you're a servant of Christ too, so make sure that what you're giving out to people that you know is grounded in Scripture. Make sure it's grounded, soaked in Scripture. As a matter of fact, I'd like to take it off my shoulders. Hey, Kendall, what do you believe about heaven? Do you believe that you got to be a Christian? And I, I'd just like to put the weight on Jesus' shoulders. Well, friend, it's not necessarily what I believe. I do believe it, but Jesus said it. Paul said it. I just like to put the burden over on Jesus' shoulders. That Jesus said he was the only way, so you have to take it up with him. I may not even like a verse, but i got to give it out as truth. Do you realize that? Now you're like taking me to task on that. But what I'm saying is, it's not whether we like it or not. It's, is it true? 
How many know there's some hard things? Is hell a hard concept? But why do you believe? How many believe in heaven? Surveys are done. How many believe in heaven? About everybody believes in heaven. Same survey when it's given out to people. How many people believe in hell? Oh, I don't believe in hell. Well, why do you believe in heaven? Because the Bible teaches a lot about heaven. Jesus talks a lot about heaven. Do you know who in the Bible talks more about hell than anybody else? Jesus. No, nope. let me rephrase that. Nobody talks more about hell than Jesus. Is that shocking? And when I read what Jesus says about hell, it makes me shiver. But why do I believe that hell is real? Because the one who died and rose again spoke of it. He warned people of it. Constantly throughout his ministry, he's warning people of it. How many of you like to be liked? Come on, raise your hand. There are only a few of you that I question who don't like to be liked. What has to come first? I want to share the truth. Yes, I want to share it as lovingly as possible because I know this. Truth, boy, it cuts at times. I want to make sure the abrasiveness is not coming from me. I want to let God's word be the thing that actually offends, not me. Amen? All right, let's move on to verse 2. So in this case, moreover, it's required of stewards to be found trustworthy. I want to be found trustworthy in giving out God's word. You should say the same thing. You should want this of me or any minister. Am I rightly handling this book? By the way, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. How about 2 Timothy 3, 16? All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for reproof and for teaching and correcting. That's my job, to take God's word. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, do you know what it says? Hey, pastor, there's going to come a time when people don't want to put up with sound doctrine. They want to have their ears tickled. And what they'll do is they'll accumulate around themselves teachers that tell them what they want to hear. So guess what? Pastors get fired all the time. You know why? I ran into a pastor friend of mine. He said, Kendall, how long have you been there? I said, 23 years. He said, wow. Somebody just told me the other day, you know how often... Seminary guys, guys that I went to seminary with, they showed up in churches and started teaching God's word, and they got fired for it, fired for it, because people didn't want to hear what God's, I know a, I know a guy that the church was growing, he was simply teaching God's word, the church was filling up, people wanted to hear God's word, and they had a bunch of people still on their church rolls that he never saw, and at one business meeting, all those people came in and they voted the pastor out. It's very shocking. And you know how many showed up the next Sunday? Like four or five. How many find that totally shocking? It happened in a little town in Missouri. Stewards. And you. How many would say, I want to be found trustworthy? Before the Lord, I, I want to do everything in my power that God gives me by His grace to be the best mother that I can be, to be the best father. And none of us are the perfect parent, okay? You're not the perfect employee. You're not the perfect boss. But how many of you as Christians would say, I, by God's grace, I want to be tr found trustworthy as an employee or as an employer or as a kid in school or college? I don't want to be cheating on my tests. I want to be teaching, I want to be uh, respectful to the teachers. I want to be respectful to my parents. And there are tons of verses like this. It, those of you who work, do so as what? As working for the Lord. I was so pleased when one of the youth said, one of my favorite verses is in Colossians. And it, it's about whatever you do. Do it heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. This is Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So no matter what occupation, no matter what you're doing, can you say, I want to do everything for the glory of God. So even though Paul is saying this about himself, and I think secondarily as pastors, 
I would say there's a principle here for all of us, and that no matter what we do, we want to be found trustworthy. But aren't you glad, ultimately, that our trustworthiness is not what saves us? Does that make sense? I mean, what, what if it was one of those things where in order to get to heaven, you had to be a perfect parent here on earth? You had to be a perfect employee here on earth. You had to be the perfect boss here on earth. You might as well just quit now and get off that treadmill. How many know that? We all know that we're saved by grace, through faith, that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. Amen? And on the other hand, on the other hand, we want to honor God in everything that we do. I want to be found trustworthy as a pastor. Verse 3, but to me, it's a very small thing to be judged by you guys. <laughs> to be examined by you. That's what Paul's saying. And I would say as a pastor, I'm accountable to you. But it's a small thing compared to the one to whom I am ultimately to give allegiance to and will be judged by. This is very comforting. It should be to many of you. But to me, it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human day. The, the Greek word is day. That day in court or any human court or any of your opinions. It's a small thing to be examined by you or any human court. In fact, I'll go even further. I don't even examine myself. That doesn't mean we don't self-evaluate. We do that all the time. It doesn't mean that I'm not concerned about how well you think I'm doing. I am. And you should say the same thing about yourself. But ultimately, where is the ultimate court of judging? By the way, look at your questions. You have your sheet with you. Number three, why is it important for all of us to understand that an ultimate, accurate evaluation of our lives can only be done by God alone? We don't know the whole story. We don't know the motives and intentions and all the surrounding circumstances. How many of you have wrongly judged things only to laugh at yourself and to kick yourself and say, I cannot believe I was falsely judging somebody? Why? Why? Because we don't have all the information. And even in our human court system, they don't have all the information. And even in our human court system, people can be bribed and paid off and all kinds of contingencies. Verse 3 to verse 4. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. Isn't that good? Look. It's a small thing for me to be examined by you guys or any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself. And I'm conscious of nothing against myself because I don't even know myself fully. But as far as my conscience goes, don't know of anything. Yet, I'm not acquitted by this fact. Here it is, this one line. Let it sink in. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Is that comforting? Is that comforting? <laughs> yes and no. Take a look at verse 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Stop right there. Therefore, connect it with verse 5, right? The one who examines me is the Lord. He's the one ultimately qualified, by the way, to give ultimate judgment. I hear people judging all the time over, look, I take it for granted. If somebody says they're a Christian and they're trusting in the Lord, you be very, very careful. Unless there is clear, I mean, talking about major evidence. Who are you to judge whether or not they're a Christian? I could give you some examples. We are so dangerous when we start quickly evaluating somebody's spirituality. 
Based on what? Do you know their hearts? Really? I mean, John Doe says he's a Christian. I'm taking for granted that he is. I don't, I don't have any other reason to think likewise. But I am very careful. Well, so many times they said they were. Took them at their word. How would you like me to look at your life and just say, I don't know if she is because uh, you eat a Burger King or something. Heard you listening to some country music the other day. Yeah, and I like Bob Seger. What's the point? He said that? No, I'm just saying, if you look back at how many people make silly judgments on all kinds of things of somebody's spirituality, aren't you glad ultimately that judgment is not in their hands, that it's ultimately in God's hands, who knows all things, by the way, who examines me as the Lord, and then... Verse 5, what's the connection for? Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Now, are there certain things that you could judge by? Yeah, we're going to see that in chapter 5. There are major sin issues that need to be dealt with. You go to somebody in private, etc. You take two more. You make sure it's scriptural. But you know what happens so much in people's relationships? Nitpicky things. Minor issues cause marital problems and workplace problems and, and wherever you have two or three more. I mean, people judge people on silly things. Do you know why I wear a beard? <laughs> Just to aggravate people. <laughs> I'm a nonconformist. If you think clean shavenness is next to godliness, you're getting this for 250 years. I just happen to have always liked beards, but it's amazing how many people make comments on facial hair. I mean, seriously. It just, I mean, I'm, I'm never amazed that, like, if you, could, if you were going to make a case scripturally, you could make a case that men should have facial hair, but you can't make a case that you can't have facial hair. How many agree? I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. It'd be like me going up saying, Brian, how come you cut? hair so short. Jeff, how come you cut your, how come you put your hair over that way? <laughs> Meaning, it's, it's neither here nor there. And if you think about it, some of you grew up, you know why, I, I've, I've had to counsel Christians who grew up in legalistic homes to where they start questioning Christianity. What am I to believe? What am I to believe? That's not in the Bible. Playing cards? I mean, some people, Christians grew up, oh, we couldn't play cards. We couldn't go to a movie. Why? Why couldn't you go to a movie? Well, there are how many know there are bad movies that you shouldn't see? There's movies I don't want to see. But I get to choose. It's the same way with the TV. I got a thing called a controller <laughs> right here. And I can click. Right? Now, if you don't want a TV, that's fine. But it's not something to judge people by. Right? There's all kinds of issues like that. Be careful. Wrong, judging wrongly has tripped up so many people. I love what he says. Don't go on passing judgment before the time. What time is that? Oh, judgment day. But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. This is why judgment, superficial judgment, it's always wrong. Evaluating. It's because we can't see the whole picture. We don't know the motive. Guess what? There is one who knows all the intentions and motives that even I can't see or you can't see. And that's why even my own examination is weak and fallible. The Lord, isn't it? So in, on one hand, it's comforting. And on the other hand, it's frightening, which causes what? It should cause all of us to say, Lord, you're the ultimate one that judges. I want to live for the audience of one. If you get this in your mind, folks, it'll transform. it should transform our, our church, how we handle each other, how we have interactions, right? It really should. It, it should cause a careful self-examination. So under question number three, why is it important for all of us? Do you know why I put all of us? You might say, well, Kendall, it's talking about pastors here. We'll take a look at question four. 
How are we to understand then? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Turn over there. You're in 1 Corinthians. Just turn over. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You're like, man, I'm glad it's just for apostles and pastors. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> chapter 5, verse 9. We have it as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Why? Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, whether according to what he has done, whether good or bad. <gasps> Kendall, I thought in my salvation Christ paid for all of my sins. He did. But how do you get around that verse? We, we can't like say, well, I thought he forgave us all of our sins. I know, but what about that verse? Let me say, is that verse in your Bible? Then there is a judgment day in which all of us will appear. And folks, let me just tell you, as a pastor, I have no, it's a mystery to me what all is going to take place. But I trust that the Lord is good and that he's righteous. My sins are forgiven. I know that. But still, this is a judgment day in which not just me, all of us are going to be, appear. Isn't that interesting? Don't go on passing judgment before the time, before that court date. But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. What? It's going to be a time of praise. From whom? From whom? You're going to get praise from God? Yeah. Revelation eleven fifteen 15 talks about the same type of issue. On that great day, the Lord is going to give out rewards and blessings. And a little faithful pastor who's been bivocational in Timbuktu, Missouri. And another pastor whose church has just grown wonders. And they got radio ministry and TV ministry. And they're going to be judged. And you know what? It could be that that bivocational pastor... Loving and shepherding those people in that small country church. Everybody's going to be like, wow. We, we can't evaluate stuff correctly. And the person who had the TV ministry and traveled around the world, and you're like, oh, the Lord is going to pull back motives and intentions. And remember chapter 3, was it gospel-centered or was it built on straw and stubble? Teach God's word correctly and properly and feed the sheep properly? Oh, friends, our evaluation, believe me, I see it all the time in, in political stuff, even among Christian denominations. As a pastor, it, it's comforting. As a Christian individual, you ought to be comforted by this. And yet, wow, this is serious stuff because it's, it's not just pastors. It, According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says the word all. You should always seek to live your life for the Lord. Make him first. Also, there's another one, Romans 14. By the way, if 2 Corinthians 5 was the only verse, verse 9 and 10, would that be enough? Yeah, but there's others. You can read that on your own time. I think it's, if you turn in a question, tell me more about this, I'm going to say I don't know much more. The Lord didn't reveal a whole lot about what th this is going to be like. But that's enough to say, I want to live my life in a way that pleases the Lord and live with a clear conscience, confessed sins, in relationship with God's people. As a pastor, I want to feed them correctly whether they like it or not. Preach the word in season and out of season. That means when they like it or when they don't like it. Just teach the word. Let, let the chips fall. Let people wrestle with the text themselves. I, a lot of times I'll just say, well, what do you get around this verse you believe the bible too don't you right how do we get around this and then let's look at verse six quickly now these things brethren i have figuratively applied to myself and apollos for your sakes we're a great example paul's saying but this applies far broader than just us we, i have figuratively applied to myself and apollos for your sakes so that in us you may learn, it's a teaching, I'm teaching you, that you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that none of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. 
So many man-made rules and ideas puff people's arrogance up and it hurts the body of Christ and hurts relationships. False judgment always seems to me just create more problems. Have you ever been a part of a church that's very legalistic and introspective and always judging everybody's motives and intentions and suspect of very... It's not a very open deal. I can name some groups that are very good at this. But I won't for the sake of time. What, do you, what does he mean that you may learn not to exceed what is written? Did Jesus have a hard time with a group of people? Hey, Jesus, this, how many ladies, uh, what, what chapter did you do this morning in Mark's gospel? Chapter 5? Well, turn over to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. This is very interesting. The Pharisees of Jesus' day believed the Bible. They were conservative, but they went beyond what is written. And they tried to judge Jesus based on those things. How many know it would always be a bad day to judge the Lord Jesus? But nevertheless, they tried. So the Pharisees, is Mark 7, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him. They come from Jerusalem. Some of his disciples were eating bread with impure hands. That is unwashed. Why? It says, for the Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. They had this ritual. Good, godly people wash their hands in this way. And it became like this thing that everybody does. And Jesus, at times, he just didn't do it. Somebody said one time, Kendall, you seem to be a nonconformist. No, I just don't like false spiritual standards. And I get my cue a lot from Jesus, who sometimes pushed the envelope to make a point. And when they'd come in from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they clean, them, clean themselves in this way. And there are many other things which they received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. They had this little ritual. And the Pharisees and scribes, they said to him, Why do your disciples not walk to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And Jesus says, Rightly didn't Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites? These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precept of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you experts set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Now, let me just say this. Jesus does this all the... It's so easy, folks, to get into a tradition and think that it's spiritual. And it becomes almost a command. And Jesus says, first of all, you don't keep the word of God and and you're keeping tradition. Now, some traditions are not bad. I keep a certain tradition. It's not wrong. I have a tradition. What's wrong is when you impose it on others, when it's not in the Bible. So according to this verse, don't go beyond what's written. That would save a lot of, how many know that would save a lot of problems? It'd make life simple, would it? Just don't go beyond what's written. Now, we we don't have time to go into this more. I would like to, and we will as we go through 1 Corinthians. But this should help church life as we interact with others. And now verse 7, I'll close with verse 7. For who regards you as superior? Spiritual pride. Usually when people have lists and traditions that they demand of others, certain criteria, this is what a good Christian is, and you're like, where's that in the Bible? Usually are prideful people. You know what I'm speaking of? They hold themselves up as a standard. And it causes relationship problems. And look how Paul asks these questions. Who regards you as superior? Puffed up. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, Why do you boast as if you had not received it? 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, he says, we've received. In Christ, we've become what? Just turn over there. Turn back to 1 Corinthians. You might want to write that down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By his doing, you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. These questions are to make them think. Who regards you as superior? Are you in Christ? Then it's enough. Are you trusting in Jesus and his shed blood as an atonement for your sins? Are you trusting in him? Then you're accepted by God. Who cares about what others' their opinions are of you if you are in Christ? Why do you let so many, so many people are, they don't live the Christian life that they should because they're always worried about what other people think. Are you a Christian? Then relish in that. Boast in that. There are always going to be people that are puffed up and think they're more spiritual. And they are going to judge you. Jesus couldn't stop the Pharisees from judging him. You'll never stop people looking down on you. Thinking they're superior. Thinking they're a better Christian. Get over it. God will deal with them on judgment day. And he's going to deal with us on judgment day. That's comforting and frightening. What do I have that I did not receive? Did I receive grace upon grace? And how can I be arrogant? How can you and I hold ourselves up? Are you a sinner saved by grace? Have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God? You believe that? then how come we can't show more grace towards other people? Shouldn't we, by the way, I do believe we are a friendly church. I do believe we are a grace-filled church. But can, as Paul said, can we exceed even more? We can. Only by God's grace I'm here. How about you? Only by God's grace I'm still a Christian. How about you? And once you understand that it frees you to worry about whether how long the pastor's beard is, or does he get it trimmed? Or I mean, I, I mean, I, okay. But other stuff, okay, people can judge you. Do you own too nice of a car or not a nice enough car? Are you afraid to talk about what your job is, or can you tell them uh, you dig ditches? I mean, if you know you're in Christ, you realize that none of that stuff matters. What matters is your relationship to God and what he thinks about you, <laughs> Right? This is so freeing. This is so freeing. And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Lord, help us, we pray. Uh, to just live by your word and the simple truth and not, not exceed it. Don't go beyond it. Thank you for this body of believers. And Lord, help us just to teach your word and love people and See people's lives transform and not really worry about what others are thinking or saying. We pray this in Christ's name and for his glorious sake. Amen. Let's stand together as we close. And by the way, let me just say, I'm always here as a